Hi, this is Conrad, your curator of Viking culture, and this is The Viking Life. And we are here with Scott Walter, the author of The Hooked X. Thank you for joining us. You know, one of the things I mentioned to you earlier was just the amount of work that you put into this. I mean, how long did you work on the Kensington runestone? Oh, geez. That's a, that's a work that, that is not over. I mean, it just, it just, it's the gift that keeps, keeps giving literally. I mean, I, I swear I could teach a college course on the Kensington runestone. It's so varied from so many different aspects, but as a geologist, as a forensic geologist, it all started with the rock, right? Yeah. And, um, it's the rock itself is a very complicated rock. It's got lots of minerals, which was good because I ended up doing a weathering study. So I had lots of minerals to choose from as uh, clocks, if you will. And everything came together in a beautiful way. And it was the rock that told me that the inscription, not just the rock, the rock of course is very old, but the inscription was hundreds of years old. And therefore, um, could not be a late 19th century hoax. And if it's not that, what else do you have? It has to be genuine, right? Absolutely. So that was what I concluded. And I didn't know at the time that I was treading on a sacred paradigm of history that the runestone just did not fit into. And it really had nothing to do with truth. Um, it had to do with maintaining the status quo of the story that the, narrative. the world is the narrative that yeah. the world is supposed to uh, adhere to. And, but in my world, the, the results are the results. The data is the data. And sometimes the results don't go your way. Well, guess what? Tough hop. It is right. what it is. And so when I concluded it was genuine, I got all this pushback and um, I'm still dealing with that. But again, I go, always go back to the rock. I trust rocks. I don't, trust some people. The rock told me what it was and I listened to the rock and therefore I followed the evidence trail and it led to 23 years later. We're yeah. starting to get to the bottom of that well. We're not at the bottom right. yet, but we're getting there. A few more inches. That's great. We look forward to it. So on the inscription, um, it was mentioned there were eight Gotlanders and 22 Norwegians. Yes. yes. Now, so that brings me to think that the Scandinavians and maybe the descendants of the Vikings had a lot to do with this. Does for sure? Would you agree? Oh yeah, no, no doubt about it. Um, you got to remember something, and I want to make sure I have my history right. But I believe in 1362, uh, Sweden and Finland maybe were all vassals under the Norwegian king. It was all one country, right? Yeah. And so uh, they would have been beholden to Norway, and of course, this would have been. Um, you know, the main seed of uh, Viking explorers taking off from Norway, coming to North America, um, you know, going back to who knows for sure how far back, but we have it documented to the 9th century, the 10th century, into the 11th century, early part. And so there's a rich history there. And you know, I go back and I talk to people and they say, well, you know, a lot of this is unknown and they didn't write it down and how can we be sure and all this you know, equivocating, trying to, you know, tamp it down. But on the other hand, think about it this way. Um, if you've got a fantastic hunting spot or fishing mm -hmm. spot, are you going to tell everybody? Right. Hell no. I mean, North America was was rich with, you know, fishing. The Basque were, were fishing for cod off the, off the uh, off in, uh, Nova Scotia. You've got timber. You've got minerals. You've got... I've heard even copper. They were... Uh, a copper got yeah, coming into copper. the Great Lakes. Yeah. The, the purest um, deposits of copper anywhere in the world right. are in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Isle Royal, and northern Minnesota in the Lake Superior region. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, they didn't get that far. Well, um, you could do trace element, uh, trace element analysis on copper. Got to remember that the copper was 99.9% .9 pure copper. Nothing even close found anywhere in the world. And it was just laying on the surface yeah. because after the glaciers melted, it plucked out the copper and it was laying all over. I still, I buy agates from farmers and every once in a while they'll say, what is this big heavy thing? It's a piece of float copper. So 
So yeah, and uh, you know, copper is what fueled the Bronze Age, and um, you know, so we well, know they were starting to make alloys and using different types of metals. Right. So. Well, in tin, they got the British Isles. So you make a trip to uh, North America, you get the copper, and on the way back, you pick up the tin. Away you go. And you have great, great swords, yeah. great strong swords. Hey, one other thing that I think is really important to point out too, as far as navigation goes, because a lot of people that are listening to this are going to say, "Well, wait a minute." How can you get through uh, Niagara Falls? You can't sail into the Great mm -hmm. Lakes there. Well, the, you're right. You can't. However, you bypass three of the Great Lakes by going up the Ottawa River. And you have to remember this, too. You're going back 1,000 years or more with the Vikings. You're going back 800 years uh, with the Templars. When the great, great glaciers melted over what is now Hudson Bay, right, and they melted away, because of the weight of that ice, it pushed down on the mm. crust. And now that sure. that ice is gone, it's rebounding. It's called isostatic rebound. And that is still happening to this day to the rate of about 8 to 10 inches, uh, inches of rebound every year annually really? in the center of the ice dome. So the point is this, is that the Great Lakes and the river systems that we see today were not like they were going back you know, many hundred sure. years, a thousand years perhaps. And they were able to bypass uh, Niagara Falls, go up the Ottawa River, and end up in the northern part of Lake Huron. And right there at Sault Ste. Marie, take a left, you go to Lake Michigan, you keep going straight, Lake Superior, the Copper. It was a lot different back then. And if they had partnered with the Native Americans, they would have understood these water routes. No question about it. Um, now, as far as the Vikings go, uh, we're not really sure what the relationship was uh, with the indigenous people, except we know towards the end that it wasn't good because uh, I've actually uh, been in a uh, sweat lodge uh, of the midday. Which mistakes is, were made. We could probably agree to that. Well, <laughs> mistakes, mistakes were made, and actually the Algonquin nations to the north met in council with the Iroquois nations, mm -hmm. who were the badass warriors, right? Yeah. And they said, look, these, these white, you know, Viking people, they didn't use that term, but, but it was the Vikings yeah. that they were talking about. They're really not very easy to deal with. And they're starting to make settlements along here. And you're going to have to deal with them sooner or later. So why don't we take care of this problem now? And according to what I was told, the Iroquois came up with the Algonquins and they wiped them out. Yeah, pushed them off. Well, there's a lot of monks in um, Europe that probably would have agreed with that assessment of the Vikings, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, they weren't the most diplomatic all the time, nope. were they? No, nope, not at all. So the Cistercians and the Templars, yep. right? They were at Got uh, Gotland in Sweden. Oh, yeah. They were Christians, right? Latin. Wait, wait, wait. Christians? What kind of Christians? Well, the they were uh, the <laughs> divine feminine Christians. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is kind one of... branch. Of, yeah, right? this, is, this is really one of the real key things that... Um, has been missed by historians or intentionally overlooked. The church certainly doesn't want you to know this, but the Templars and the Cistercians, actually the Cistercians, um, they are the most misunderstood uh, and most successful monastic order in history. They started with one abbey at Sito uh, that was founded in uh, 1095 or 1090, can't remember exactly, by uh, Robert Molesme. But in 1113, Bernard de Clairvaux, joined the order with 30 family members, including two of the original Templar Knights that went to the Holy Land, including the first Grand Master, Hugh de Pan, was his uncle. Now, the truth of the matter is this was a coup d'etat, and they joined the Cistercian order. They, uh, they grew this monastic order from one abbey in situ to over 300 abbeys by the time Bernard died in 1153. Now think about that, going from one abbey, and he joined in 1113. So 40 years later, they expand and have 300 abbeys. By the time the Templars were finally put down in 1307, there were over 750 abbeys. I mean, my God, that type of expansion would make, like Haley said, McDonald's blush, right? Right. And nobody knows. Quite a few franchises. Yeah, and, and really nobody fully understands what they were really all about. But getting back to the whole ideal, uh, ideological question, everybody assumed that they were the good Catholics, right? Well, they were brilliant in that they did not embrace Catholicism at all. In fact, 
they just maintained an ancient ideology that they they had all along, uh, which was embracing a concept called monotheistic dualism, which is basically a single deity that has dualistic aspects, uh, this concept of mm -hmm. opposites that keep things in balance, like male, female, heaven and earth, good, bad, light, dark, yin, yang, right? right. So uh, that was the ideology that they embraced. And so the Virgin Mary, of course, uh, was embraced by them. She was honored and venerated by them. But all she was was really a metaphor for the ancient goddess that mm -hmm. they venerated because the Roman church had, you know, devalued women and brought them down here. And here's the male aspect, right? But by venerating and elevating the feminine mm -hmm. within Catholicism, right? Now you're back to that dualism. The balance. So the balance. And, and so this is, this is the, the dirty little secret, if you will, of the Cistercians that the church didn't figure out for 200 years. And when they did, they were pissed. Yeah. So part of the put down that we hear about in 1307, that all you ever hear about is, oh, the King of France owed a lot of money to the Templars. And he did, right? But when you have some major thing that happens like war or some event, there's always more going on than just the main narrative, mm -hmm. right? And again, the narrative is being dictated by who and what is their agenda, right? Right. I mean, this is just life, but that's definitely what was going on. And let's just say that when 1307 came, the suppression of the Templars, there was a lot, lot more going on than just money. Sure, sure. So the question, you know, the fact that they, you know, conducted their services in Latin, but on the Kensington Rune Stone, they're mm -hmm. using runes. Scandinavian runes. Okay, so... Medieval Scandinavian runes. Is this because they were coming from Scandinavia, or was it now coded? Well, I will tell you this. We have not gone public with this yes, yet. Are you going to break it on the Viking life? <laughs> well, actually, in one of the books that we're selling, uh, there is a name of a monk. And it turns out we are pretty confident that that person was probably the author of the Kensington Runestone inscription. So you've been able to find the author? We think so. That's fantastic. And it's been confirmed in the other set of documents that I'm going to talk about tonight. That same name shows up. And what's interesting is that the person who carved the runestone based on the language, the runes, the dialect, the grammar, the dating, everything that's used on it, pointed to the island of Gotland, which of course is Sweden now, was, you could say Sweden then, but really part of Norway. But there are so many unique traits that go just to this place. We know that right. the author of the inscription, likely the carver too, uh, was educated on the island of Gotland. That's why I went there five times, right? Right. And found everything. Why? Because the runestone, the, the rock, told me that it was authentic, right? So that means if the inscription is indeed medieval and carved in 1362, that means that everything in that inscription has to be consistent with the 14th century, right? All this stuff had to exist. Now, the scholars said a lot of the stuff didn't exist. And I said, frankly, bullshit. You guys are yeah. wrong because the rock says you're wrong. And so I went over there and I found everything that they were too lazy to go in their own backyards to look for. Why? Because it's a hoax. Why bother? The reason yeah. I went is I knew it had to be there. And sure enough, it was. And this doesn't make me smart or brilliant. It's logic. Well, it makes it, it relentless. Has to be true. You had to find the answer. Well, I, I just got pissed because off. Because the answer was there. It was there. Just I knew it was there. I just had to go find it. Right. Now, I, I do have to just say one thing. Um, in, con in, in, in To give it its proper context, Gotland was the last place that the Scandinavian scholars right. studied the runic inscriptions of Scandinavia. Um, partly because it was on an island. I don't know why. It just was last. So... And there are hundreds of medieval runic inscriptions there. I mean, there every yeah, one the, of these 99 churches that I visited all had grave slabs either mortared into the floors mm -hmm. on the inside or standing up on the outside or some laying flat, but most of them were vertical to preserve them. And this is where I found everything. But in fairness to the scholars, this information was not published right. until the 2000s. And I was really the first guy to go there and look at these inscriptions in context with the runestone 
And that's why I found everything before they did. So it wasn't that I was so brilliant. Timing had everything to do with it. Well, we talked last night about maybe the universe pointing to you and saying it's your time. Step into the spotlight, Scott. I'm not saying. I I'm am. just saying. No, you're saying. <laughs> so the, where I was going with this is, all right, so we've got Scandinavian Cistercians and Templars, right? We've got runes. Like, how did they, how did they know about North America? Where? From the Vikings. Okay. Come so, on. So this is You're a Viking. You I know, I that. know. I'm just walking you down the path here. <laughs> so um, they're hearing about it in the Greenlander saga, in Eric's saga. They yeah. know it's over there. You know, I'm leading to the fact that maybe they never stopped going over there. Maybe they continued to pluck resources out as needed. Hell yes. Okay. Absolutely. So you gotta remember something. The Hebrews were there before them. The Phoenicians were there before them. And who knows? The Egyptians were probably there before them. And maybe the Atlanteans. I mean, the whole, if you talk to the indigenous people and you earn their mm -hmm. trust, they said people have been coming here forever. And they've been going over there. Sure. So this yeah. whole idea, I mean, if you talk to scholars today, I mean, it's, it's like they would have you believe there was a fence around the North American yeah. continent. Nobody gets in, nobody gets out. I mean... It's insanity, really, when you think about it. it. Think about this, okay? Right now, the current narrative is this. The Vikings were here up into about the middle of the 11th century. Let's just say around the year 1000. And then nothing happened for 500 years right. until Chris came over, and he didn't even set foot on the land that we now call United States of America that already had people, millions of people living here. Yeah, I mean, give me a millions. break. I mean, that doesn't even pass the smell test, does it? No. Yeah, it doesn't add up for no. certain. So come on. I mean, let's be real. So let's move to Henry Sinclair. Sure. And on page, uh, let's see here, chapter 33, page 192, you call him Jarl Henry Sinclair. Was that, was that by accident? No, that's, that's what he was called. And, <clears throat> but you got to remember something. He was a vassal to the Norwegian king. And since I've written this book, new information okay. has come to us. And what's really cool is these documents are, well, we have three books of his personal journals that were written from when he was eight years old. His father gave him his journal. He said, you're to write down these things that you are going to want to remember when you're a man. And eight is a very important number in Templarism. It's a very important number to the indigenous people. It has to do with the planet Venus. And it's very sacred. I mean, if you look at a Templar cross, it has eight points, right? Um, and there's, it just goes on and on from there. But the point is, is that he would report and meet with the Norwegian king on a regular basis mm -hmm. because he was made the the jarl and the and eventually the earl of Orkney. And so mm -hmm. he would have to report to the, because that was Norwegian property at that time, and right. he would report back. And of course, being a sailor. Right, ship captain. He probably interacted with other ship captains in Norway. Well, living on an island, you think there'd be a few sailors around? Ah, you'd think so, yeah. right? And they talk, right? You have a couple of beers, and next thing you know, by the way, there's this land over here. Got to right? tell you about some place I was just at. So, Absolutely. I mean, if you don't think that happened, uh, you, you just don't know. What you're well, that's about. part of that uh, that isolation chamber that North America right. was in. We don't talk about North America. But on the other hand, you know, you got to remember that was also very sacred, very secret information. And when you're talking about somebody who was uh, that close to the king, um, who, um, you know, we know that the Templars were going over there on a regular basis. So this started probably shortly after the last mm -hmm. Vikings came back, maybe right as they came back. So the fact that the Scots knew about North America, probably from the Norwegians, is the most logical explanation. Makes sense. And then yeah. you add in the astrolabe navigation devices right yeah. and so all of the plates all 12 plates scotland yeah norway iceland greenland all the way over those yep. were the plates on it was that. island hopping yep yes and and here's the thing why would you have those plates if you're not going over there yeah why would you have them right wouldn't even be useful if you're going I mean, to give the me a break i yeah. mean how, how straightforward is that but here's another thing that i was told by a navigator who's made that route multiple times. He said, if the weather is right, you can take off from, uh, from Kirkwall in the uh -huh. Orkneys and go to the, uh, to the Shetlands, to the Faroes, to Rockall, to Iceland, 
to Greenland, to uh, uh, Newfoundland, to uh, Nova Scotia. And he said, if the weather is right, you get to a certain point about halfway, and you can't see land where you came from, and then you can see your you can see yeah. your next destination, and you can do that the whole way. Now the weather's not going to be perfect, right? But if it is, you could actually see it by sight all the way. That's fantastic. Island hopping, essentially. Makes it, makes it a lot easier. But they had the tools to be able to do this. So the next piece of this story are the, the holes, the stone holes. Stone holes. Right? So we've talked a lot about it, that these are breadcrumb trails yep. for those who come after. And I'm glad you used the term stone holes because... I don't remember. I don't even remember if I said it in the book, but um, so many people for so long um, have talked about these holes cut in glacial boulders on the Omen Farm where the rune stone was found, and they call them mooring stones. Right? When you say mooring stones, that implies an interpretation that a steel pin was in there with a ring, and you tie boats up. Right? That's what mm -hmm. a mooring stone is. But these aren't mooring stones. There's no water there where the rune stone. There's puddle lakes, but yeah. they didn't sail into Kensington, the Kensington party. They walked, right? And so to call them stone holes is describing, it's factually describing what they are because it may not be a mooring stone. In fact, they aren't in that case. Breadcrumb trails is one mm -hmm. of the, the obvious interpretations. And there's uh, sacred geometry that is used for uh, these things, as you saw with the relocating the rune stone. Because my thesis has always been that it well, for crying out loud, it's not my thesis. It says it right on there. Acquisition business, taking yeah. up land. I mean, right. how else can you interpret that? And that suddenly changes the game in my mind to, you know, people just looked at it as a story of a tragic battle between these these Vikings and, uh, and indigenous people when, in fact, that whole red from blood and death part of the inscription is an allegory. Right. So it's not it's not to be taken literal. So the stone holes are in other locations, just, just not on the... All the way across the Great farm. Lakes, going up the St. Lawrence, all across the country. And if you understand how and why they did these things, you can go looking in strategic places like where rivers split, mm -hmm. um, geographic high, uh, high places where you're going to make you know, observations, astronomical observations, and just sighting, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, they just seem to show up there. And they're very innocuous. They're just these little rounded triangular holes. And a, and a mechanical drill is not going to make a rounded triangular no. hole. The only way you're going to do it is by hand pounding with a straight chisel. The, um, the physics of th that hole being created by that shaped chisel is what makes that hole. And uh, they're very important, but they're so easily overlooked and misinterpreted. I'm really glad you asked about those. Fantastic. And it seems like they would be put where someone traveling through an area would naturally traverse. Yes. And so somebody coming behind them that's right. would, would understand this is what we do. This is our tradition. So we need to be looking for these things. And if we don't find them, we're not on the right trail. But the other thing that they did with them, can I borrow your yeah. pen for a sec? A lot of times they would put them in the hole, a stick, and then during the day it would cast a shadow. Sure. So at a certain time of day, go here. Point you in the right direction. It made me think of the rune stones that the Vikings left over their history because they would like to put them in high-traveled areas so right. people could see. Yep. Their... They were signposts. Right. 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 <clears throat> so now we have this astrolabe. We've got the... the... With the arc decks. Was right. That, wasn't that awesome? Yeah, that was fantastic. Oh, my God. When I found that, I just about... Well, all the I couldn't believe connect. it. Yeah. You've got the history and the, the sagas telling people about North America. You've got the island hopping. Is it possible there are other... And then you've got the spirit pond, pond stone. Three stones found you've by got Walter Nar Elliott. Narragansett. Narragansett rune stone. Yeah. Right. So is it possible there are other rune stones Absolutely. in Gr Greenland, Iceland, you know? Along the way. Or people? in North America. Think right. about this. There's no question. I had the, the rune stone in my office for uh, my lab for, for a few weeks. And one of the things we noticed is that it's intentionally been split down to this mm -hmm. sacred shape. I'll talk about my lecture tonight. Um, where's the rest of it? 
could it be out there somewhere? Could it potentially be located using the sacred geometry with stone holes right. to be put together to form an even larger land claim, right? The story it's could a, continue. Well, there's another piece to it somewhere, yeah. right? Right. That's that's one that can still be found. So the answer to your question is, hell yes. So you 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 talk about the Templars and it kind of continues. Is it possible the Viking age ended, but the descendants of those became Templars? Of course. Right? Absolutely. That evolved. In 1066, when Christianity went up through Scandinavia and the, and the Viking age ended, people didn't stop having children, right? I right. mean, come on. <laughs> they didn't stop being who they were. No, no. And uh, a lot of those traditions continued on. Now, one of the things that you'll find interesting uh, with the Sinclair Weems journals uh, and Earl Henry Sinclair and Jarl Henry Sinclair is they practice the old religion and the new religion of Christianity. Uh, they knew that they had to assimilate um, uh, ideologically a little mm -hmm. bit with the church because they were a powerful force that just, you know, you couldn't ignore them. Mm -hmm. Now in Scotland, they had plenty of issues with the church and they were excommunicated a number of times, but um, but they also still had to be wary of it. They had to be prepared. You never knew when you were going to find yourself in a situation where, you know, your Celtic um, uh, um, pagan ways would mm -hmm. just not go over too well. So if you understood both, that was just smart. Just kind of lean towards whoever is, is yeah. leading the discussion. Yeah, read the room, right? right. Exactly. <laughs> Well, that's fantastic. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. I mean, we just had a great time reading the book. It's fantastic. Well, I can tell you've read it, and I have to say I'm really impressed. Um, you're as excited as I was when I first was writing this thing, and um, I think it's really good that you have this, this Viking connection that morphed into the Templar connection, and it's a mystery, right? What happened? I mean, the Viking Age ended in North America, and then what happened, right? This 500-year yeah. nothing? No, a right. lot happened, and the world is just now starting to learn about that. And, you know, this was a Scandinavian thing. Um, and even though Scotland was, um, you know, they were, you know, made these trips that we're going to talk about, they were intimately connected with Norway and Gotland and what is now Sweden and a lot of, and, and you got to remember something. One last thing. In Freemasonry, <clears throat> we welcome all colors, all creeds, all nationality. We don't care, right? You can be anything you want. Religiously, you can be a, a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, a Buddhist. Natives take their obligation on an eagle feather. We don't care because whatever you call deity, we're all talking about the same thing. And how you venerate that deity is your business. It's nobody else's business, right? So we welcome everyone. And it's the same in Templarism, right? Mm -hmm. You've got, I mean, it's it's like in the Civil War, you probably heard stories about, um, you know, maybe a Confederate soldier was sitting in a ditch and they were ready to garret him, right? And a Northern soldier saw the Masonic sign of distress. This is a brother, right? So you have obligations to protect him. He's still gonna be captured and be a prisoner, but you're gonna treat him well. This went on during the Crusades. The same thing happened sure. when the Templars were fighting the Muslims, and it went both ways. They would meet um, in lodge, if you will. So when they weren't fighting, they were meeting, and they would have these negotiations, sure. just like natives tribes did, like the Algonquins mm -hmm. and the uh, the Iroquois I was telling you about, because they were historical enemies. So um, this whole thing about it's like a code meeting, of conduct. It's a code of conduct. It's an honor thing, and so. Um, but you need to be taught these things. You need to understand that we're all equal, right? And it doesn't matter what color your skin is, what nationality you are, what religion you are. When we meet in Lodge, we don't talk about politics and religion because that's what divides us. We focus on what unites us. And at the end of the day, if you cut your arm or he cuts his arm or I cut my arm, what color is our blood? It's all red. It's all red. Well, that's a good lesson for us all. So all right. thank you for joining right. The Viking Life. Till the next time. Absolutely. This story continues. All right. Thank you.